Paul. Well, 
we went to uh, our district conference yesterday down in Lincoln, Georgia, had a wonderful conference. And there were uh, at least uh, six that stood up that are beginning, to, uh, starting to take MIP and, and they're ready to start churches. They're starting some more churches. One is about to open this morning over in Lexington. And then there were three from Johnny Brewington's church that were there and they're in the, in the midst of, uh, you know, that process of MIP and all. But I looked around and I thought, you know, God is still raising up people. God is still raising up people. And no matter what, God's still got a people that's willing to go. And it amazed me how many Spanish churches that are raising up. And it's just a, an awesome thing uh, to think. And they began to talk about how many churches, you know, that we have here in America and how many, oh, mercy, overseas, the churches that are going forth and and they're starting new programs for young ministers and they're starting uh, Bible schools and a lot of it is on online and a lot of good training, a lot of good training for ministers. So I thank God for that. So keep our district superintendent all in, in your prayer. Would you stand all over the house if you are able this morning? Brother Steve, takes to the Lord, please. Yes, Almighty God. Thank you, God, for Calvary. Thank you for the mercy you've shown us. Father, we live in the area this morning. God, you're a healing God. You know all things. There's nothing you can't do. It's in your hands, God. And we're looking under the hills which come with our strength. Our help and our strength comes from you. Touch you. you touch all of that entire family, God. Each one of them. Sister Roby this morning, and she can breathe the breath of life. Johnny, God, and what she's going through and different ones that have been named and requests that are spoken and unspoken. And God above all else in these last days, we need we need people that will preach your gospel. We need people, God, that will go forth in the ministry. And, and Father, we're praying for all those churches that were represented and all those young men, Lord, that were beginning to step out and going into the schools, God, to be able to do what they can to better themselves. We thank you, Lord, for our district, our superintendent, and all those that were there yesterday. But Lord, have your way to remain for this service, God. We pray your will be done here, your will be set free, and we'll be ever mindful, God. And the Lord is honored and praised in this house this morning. And the church says, Amen. You might be seated there a minute. I'm going to ask Travis if going to be coming, and after Travis comes, then we're going to receive our morning tithes and offerings, and then we've got a, uh, another after that, and then we'll minister by the grace of God. Go ahead, Travis. Pray for him. All of this has been real quick uh, because we didn't know which way we were going to have to go this morning. Thank you. Smiles on all their faces as they. 
spin around and sing. Don't that sound like heaven? Don't that sound like home? Where the Son of God is reigning. And those tears of fire we go. Don't that sound like cold? Darkness there is overtaken by the light that's always on. Don't you worry about the cross. It was paid in full by Jesus. We hung upon the cross. And all the things he promised will be there just like he said. His blood he shed. Don't oh, that sound like heaven? Don't oh, that sound like home? Where the Son of God is reigning, and those tears are finally gone.
I wanted to share the piece that we're about to present. We did this at the Women's Conference. Um, it was a quick pull together, it was a reminder. But what I want to share is that this piece is about your name being written down in glory. My sister's name was written down in glory, and when she closed her eyes to sight of heaven, she opened them in glory. Yours will too be open in glory. What I want to tell you, this piece that we're going to do is the actual last piece that she and her daughter presented at their church that we took from and made our own piece of. And oftentimes, we would do that. She would see a piece that we did and say, oh, we can make that our own. Well, this was the one we said we can make that our own. And so we want to dedicate this to our big sister, Tammy Schmidt.
by the help of God this morning to minister the Word of God. I'm glad I wasn't me, because if I was doing that, I wouldn't be able to preach. <laughs> I'd probably lay out the floor out there somewhere. You, you know, age kind of does that, too. Praise God. But we're going, we're going to do what God gives us as a young people are going out back there. Thank you, Jesus. Can you say thank you, Jesus? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Praise yes. the Lord. What a good God we yes. serve, Charles. I feel his touch in the house. Yes. I feel his presence. Amen. I just know that God is with us. Amen. And God has a plan, church. Yes. God yes. has a plan. We look around and we say to Sister Luke, we've been through this, we've been through that. God still has a plan. Amen. It doesn't change God. It doesn't change one iota. He knew everything before everything happened. That's right. He knew it before the eons of time and he still knows it. And God still has a plan. Amen. And I want to minister by the help of God this morning and I've titled it Victory in the Valleys. Victory in the valleys. How many of you have been through a valley situation in your life? How many of you have experienced the victory that comes out of it? Amen. We can give God the glory and the praise this morning for all that he has done. You, you might say to Sister Luke, I lost my love. It was still victory if he died in the Lord. My goodness gracious, we ought to be happy that we get to see him again. God's give us the opportunity in the privilege. That's right. What a God we serve. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14. We're going to read 1 Kings 20 and 28. Let's go ahead. First Kings 20 and 28. And there came a man of God and spake unto the king of Israel and said, Thus saith the Lord, because the Syrians have said, The Lord is God of the hills, but he's not God of the valleys. Therefore will I deliver all of this great multitude into thine hand, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Second Corinthians 2 and 14. Now thanks be unto God, which always, always, Causes us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the Savior of his knowledge by us in every place. He always makes us to triumph. Father, thank you this morning for your word. Thank you, God, that we can call upon you and know that we can look under the hills from which cometh our help, for our help cometh from the Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you said when our heart is overwhelmed, lead us to the rock that is higher than I, and that rock is Jesus. And I thank you, God, this morning that it doesn't matter what valley we go through, there's always victory in the valley. And the church says, Amen. might be seated. He said, now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. This tells me this morning that we are triumphant. That we have victory because of Calvary. We're not trying to get victory. We're not trying to work up victory. But we have victory through the cross of Calvary. And we just have to walk in that victory and not let the enemy steal that from us and tell us that there is no victory because he is nothing except a liar. If he tells you you're unworthy, you're not fit, to, you're never going to make it, you know it's just the opposite. Because he's lying unto you. But trouble is we magnify the power of God, Ashley, a whole lot more than we ever magnify the power of 
devil. I see you as a, you as a post Calvary devil. You might have had some power way back yonder, but you haven't had a drop of it since he died on the cross of Calvary and defeated you. And I know that death and burial and resurrection of Jesus has triumphed over anything you could do in the day we're living. And there's coming a day, Richard used to say all the time, he's going to say that he's going to look down one day upon that day, that devil and upon the Antichrist and all of them and say, are you the one who did this to us? Why was I afraid of you? Look at you. You're nothing. And church, that's exactly what he is. He is nothing and he can do nothing except what you and I allow him to do. That's right. His power, Terry, has been vanquished by the power of the Lord Jesus. He has been tried by the heavenly tribunal for war crimes. He's already been sentenced. He's already been doomed to a lake of fire. And that sentence will soon be carried out. He's going to be bound for a thousand years. And church, that's going to be quicker than you and I think it is. Look around at this world. Look what's going on in society. My goodness, they're already predicting what a horrible recession we're going into. Church, I'm telling you, this thing is winding up. And his time is about over with. Give it the Lord. That word triumph in the Greek is triambio. I hope I'm saying it right. Triambio, which actually has a fascinating uh, history to it. The triambio in Rome was literally a famous day called the Victory Parade. And that's what the word means, triambio, the Victory Parade. Parade. It's a reference to what would happen in Rome and other places when a conquering general would come back from a successful military campaign where he had destroyed the enemy and he would come in and there would be a large parade that would take place. It was a triambium and the people, man, that would line the streets everywhere. And they would cheer the conquering general as he would come through there. And they would put singers up in the forefront. And the singers would dance and they would sing praises and honor the general and honor the king. And, and, and not only that, but they had women, young maidens. And those maidens had jars of perfume. And Justin, they would take and as they go along that parade ground and they would pour out the perfume. And the, the, the scent of that thing would go up into the air. And it was just such a fascinating time. It created an aroma, an atmosphere, and you could sense and you could smell the victory. You hear me, church? Amen. Directly behind those perfumers. Directly behind those singers would come the conquering general. He would be riding in a chariot and his soldiers would be coming in behind him. But also there would be another one that would be there, but he was not a willing vessel wanting to be there. He was the one that the general had conquered. And he would come through there. He had been stripped of his armor. He had been stripped of everything he had. Most of the time, they would even take his clothes off of him. And the crowd would taunt him and make fun of him as he come through the city. It was a victory parade. It was a triumphal. And one day, we're going to look at the enemy that you and I fight. And we're going to have victory. And we're going to be in that parade. And it's the very word that Paul uses in 2 Corinthians 2 and 14 when he says, Now thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph or ride in a victory parade. Church, our enemy's been defeated. Yeah. He's been stripped. If we could really get that down in here. Yeah. 
if we can really get that, and what we need to do is we need to start singing and praising. Oh, sister, look, I'm going through a problem. I've got a situation. I'm in a deep valley. Start singing. Yeah. Start praising. Yeah. Yeah. Start eating your kids. Yeah. Yeah. Let that devil know he's already been That's defeated. Right. Right. Listen, Christianity is based on a resurrection. Jesus is alive. But the truth is, most people betray him as dead. Their singing is dead. Their preaching is dead. Do you know that you can feel a church whether or not it's alive or whether it is dead? You know it when you walk through the doors. Praise God. You know why the perfumers ought to have been in here lifting up their hands, praising God, pouring out the fragrance of the heaven until when anybody walks through the door, they can smell. And when we do that, our conquering general, which is Jesus Christ himself, he enters in. He will ride in upon his chariots. And the Bible said in Psalm 68 and 17 that the chariots of the Lord are 20,000s and thousands of thousands. My Lord, church. When we begin to praise God, think about that. In this victory parade, God mounts his chariots and manda the angels of God. They begin to, the Lord of hosts, and, and they will begin to move in heaven. And, and I don't know what they do up there. I wish I could see into heaven. I wish I was a fly on the wall right now. I really do, but I'm not. One day I will be not only a fly on the wall, I'll be right there. Well, I'll be one of them and say, Lord, give me that white horse. I don't even like horses down here. I can't ride a horse, but when I get up yonder, the Bible tells me I'm coming back to it. been talking to. First of all, he is a defeated foe. Yes. He tries to make us think he's greater than God. Right. He uses fear, Brother Steve. Yes, he God. uses fear. He talks to you through here. Right. And he tells you, you're going to die from this. You're going to this and you're going to that. But I'm here to tell you and I say it again, he is defeated. Jesus took the keys from death, hell, and the grave and took them away from him. And I've said it before and I'll say it again. That devil is so defeated, he does not even have the keys to his own house. That's right. That's how the is. The devil is also destroyed. We've already talked about that. Hebrews 2 and 14. Jesus, through his death, destroyed him who had the power of death. That is the devil. Did Jesus gave the devil a death blow at Calvary. Yes. He's never recovered. That's right. He is also disarmed. Colossians 2 and 15. Jesus said, having spoiled, stripped, disarmed, principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing, triumphing over him. That's victory. Yes. Honey, he has no weapons anymore. He has every weapon formed against you. None of them's going to prosper because he really has no weapons except lying and deceit. And you, if you're close to God, you'll recognize those. You'll stop him before he goes any farther with him. We let him deceive us, church. But if you stay close to God, as I just said, you will recognize his tactics and you can kick him out of here. And the fourth thing, the devil is doomed. How many of you read the back of the book? Yeah. He's doomed. He's doomed. Revelation 20 and 10. They shall cast him into the lake of fire where there shall be torment. You hear that? His fate is sealed. We are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus our Lord. How are we more than conquerors? Because we don't have to conquer him. He's already been conquered. We just have to walk in what he's already done. And one day they'll look at, as I said, they'll say, look at that puny thing. Look at that. And he's the one that destroyed the world. Were we crazy to listen to him? 
But Jesus has conquered the devil. And most of the time, it's not him dragging you down. It's our own unconquered flesh. Amen. Come on, church. That's why we are to be like Jehoshaphat, what he did. Ordinarily, in the natural, whatever battle we do and I fight, we win the battle, and then we have the victory parade. You know, then we pray to God, God, I want that battle. I thank you, God. I thank you, God, for doing it. But the thing about it is, Jehoshaphat didn't do that. He obeyed God. He put the singers and the preachers out first. And then when he did that, God moved on his behalf, and the battle was won. Anybody can praise God after the victory. But how many of us can praise him when we get in the middle of a valley? Or about to go through one. That's right. And you might say, but sister, Luke, I'm in that valley right now. You don't know. You just don't know. Honey, valleys are real. You think I don't know that? Honey, I've been through enough of my life. Tears are real. Valley experiences are real, but also understand God is a God of the valleys as well as He's God of the mountains. Joseph Hope, Jehoshaphat sent in those who knew how to win the battle. He sent in the praisers into the battle. We got any praisers in here? Oh, come on. They ain't a fool to y'all. Jehoshaphat, there was a man by the name of ben Hadad. He was a Syrian captain and he came into Israel and he fought against them on the hill of Samaria and he defeated them. But six months later, he came after Israel again. You remember last week or maybe the week before that I told you, it's not the initial battle that you usually lose. It's when the enemy turns around and he's going to take back what you just took away from him. And that's the battle you really got to look out for. That's right. And in 1 Kings 20 and 28, he said to Ahab, he said to Israel, that's when he said, your God is not a God of the valleys. We've never seen you win in the valleys. We've always fought you on the mountains over here. And we've always been defeated. But you're not going to win in those valleys. Has he ever told you that? Come on. You've got cancer. You'll never win that cancer. You, you've got a wayward child. they will never come back to God. Come on. We've all heard his voice. We know what he says. He's alive. That's right, Angie. But when they fought Israel in the valley, they found out our God is not only a God of the mountains, but our God is also a God of the mountains. He told us in Isaiah 43 and 19, he said, I'll make a way in the wilderness. He said, I'll send rivers when you're in your desert. I'll give drink unto my people, my chosen ones. Now, that's the mighty promises that God gives us. Let me mention very quickly three valleys that you're going to find yourself in at one time or another. And you would think that when you get in them that it's a valley of defeat. But every valley I find, I don't care from the beginning to the end, every time you study out those valleys that God places in the Bible and the enemy comes in there, it always ends in God having victory. Amen. You hear me, church? Yeah. One of them in 2 Samuel 5. It's called the Valley of Raphim. Do you know what the word Raphim means? Giants. It's a valley of giants. 2 Samuel 5. We know that the word tells us David was anointed three times. He was about 16 or 17 the first time. He was about 30 and then around 37, somewhere in there. He had three anointings. David stood in the office of a prophet, a king, and a priest. He carried a 30-fold, a 60-fold, and a 100-fold anointing. And when the Philistines heard that David was anointed the third time, they went after him. You see, the higher that you go with God, the more anointed you are, the more the devil will attack you. That's right. Come on. The enemy set out to attack, and I'm just showing.
shortness thing. There's a blockade in the Valley of Rephaim, the Valley of Giants. Uh, and, and I'm going to ask you again, have you ever been in a Valley of Giants? I'm talking about a gigantic problem. Oh, yes. Yes. You know what I'm talking about? Don't you, Sean? You know what it's like? That's what Judy's going through right now. That's what Gary's going through right now. It's what Amanda and them have gone through. And they gigantic problems. Tell you, y'all went through that. Every one of you in here has gone through some gigantic problems. And you didn't know what you were going to do. Trouble. It, it just felt like there was trouble everywhere. But in the Valley of Giants, God spoke to David. And David said, Lord, how shall I go up and fight? He done the feed him one time. And this time he says, how shall I go up and fight him? I'll just paraphrase here. And at first, God told him, he said, you shall doubtless go up. Doubtless, I'm going to, to defeat the enemy. You see, you can't have doubt. you got to believe in the word of God. And bless God if he doesn't turn around. And again, the enemy comes. And God says, or David says to God, how am I going to get out of this? First of all, you know what he told him? He said, I want you to change the name. Well, he changed the name. But I'm going to put it like this. God is saying to you and I, when we're in a valley and we can be doubtless, we can change the name of our valley. Yeah. He said, I want you to call it Baal Perizim, which means he is Lord of the, mat of the breakthrough. God has mastered my breakthrough. And we need to rename some valleys that we're going through. And we need to quit calling them my valley of uh, children's problems. My valley of uh, financial situations. Amen. My valley of physical problems. And, and we need to quit talking about all of this stuff. They may be there. I'm not denying that. But you need to say, but my God says it's Baal Perizim. He is rename that valley is what you got to do. You see what the devil meant for evil, you got to change that thing. Your breakthrough will come. Church, sometimes we get defeated by our own mouth. We talk ourselves into more problems and more troubles and, and David killed those giants and, and then he turns around and, and, and he asked God, he said, well, what about this time? What do I do this time? And and do I find him the same way? See, sometimes instead of going to God and getting directions, we think we got all the answers. That's right. And there was a time that God said, no, don't find him the same way. You just follow him. He said, this time, you let me do it. Again, and he said, I'm going to do it. You just watch for the uh, goings in the top of the mulberry bushes. What was he talking about? That word goings is the marching. He was talking about the bands of angels. That God was sending the end of the battle. And he said the goings, the marching of the angels in the top of the mulberry bushes. And when you see that and hear that, then you step forward and do. And he defeated the enemy. You see, there's nothing too giant that God can't handle. That's right. If we listen, Tangie, Terry, if we will listen and we'll hear what God is saying, and you see, God gets us in these valley situations, we can't even think straight. That's right. Because we begin to worry. That's right. We begin to walk in fear. Yes. And we begin to hear the voice of the enemy. And could we don't hear the voice of God when that happens. Because right. fear and faith can't walk together in the same place. And we've got to get rid of that fear and we listen to what the Lord says. And we'll hear that. He'll win our battle for us. Right. But there's a valley of giants that all of us face. Some of you are in it right now. Some of you are getting ready to go through it. But let God fight that battle for you. Keep your ears tuned to what God is saying. Keep your eyes open to the spirit realm. Don't go by what you just feel in your flesh. If you do, you'll be defeated. But have eyes to look beyond flesh to see what the spirit realm is showing you. And then there's the valley of dry bones. We all know literally it man Israel. 
But I want to use it in a spiritual way this morning for the church. What happens when you get in the valley of dry bones? Ezekiel 37. God told the prophet. He says, son of man, can these dry bones live? Oh, Lord God, thou knowest. I mean, if it has to be that, and I was looking over a field, and it wasn't nothing but bleached, dry, dead bones. I said, my Lord, no, they can't live. There ain't nothing there but old bones. But have you, have you ever had your dream to die? Come on, church. Have you ever had it? And seemingly, you try to revive it, and there's nothing there. That's right. You go over and you walk over to that dream or that vision that God gave you, and you thought it would happen, and you knew he told you. You knew it did, and, and you feel it begin to die, and, and you reach down, and you try to give it CPR, and you try to raise that vision back, and, and, and seemingly, you just can't find it again. But see, what you don't understand is when God gives you a vision, and I'm talking about a vision or a dream really from God, and it's for your life, and it's for your ministry, it's for your church or whatever, when you really get it from God, and He really places it deep down in your heart, that vision, the first thing that happens, it'll begin to crucify you. What are you talking about, Sister Luke? Because sometimes when God tells us something, it gives us a great vision or something we know is from God, we'll get to the place where we begin to worship what he told us more than we worship God. We get all tuned in to doing that vision. Oh, look what God's going to do for me. Look how great God's going to make me. Oh, I'm going to go way up on this vision or that vision. And God has to sanctify your own flesh. And he takes you through a process of death, birth, and resurrection to where you think that dream is gone. It's dead. It'll never happen again. But when he gets you to where you're looking to God and not to what you were supposed to be doing over here, all of a sudden, honey, you can reach down and there will be a resurrection process to take through and your flesh will begin again to realize, oh, You've renewed that in my heart. You've made another way for me. You've opened the door that I thought was dead and gone. And God, I thank you that the vision is being rekindled in my heart once again. You speak over here. You rename that valley of Raphael. You rename what that giant has done to you in that valley over there. But when it comes to the valley of dead visions and what looks like is never going to happen, and there come a day you'll raise up and you all of a sudden, something on the inside of you will say, prophesy, prophesy, prophesy to that vision. Prophesy to those dead dry bones. Let it begin to rise again because God is rekindling that in your heart and you begin to prophesy It's not just to foretell future events. To prophesy, it doesn't take real, just the spiritual people who can do it. No, anybody that knows God can do it. Because it means to speak the word of God into your circumstance. Some of you need to do that. There's some things that have died out of you. And you knew they used to be there. And God is beginning to rekindle the fires. And you're beginning to get hope again. And you're beginning to get a desire. And what you used to have and you lost and you thought you'd never have, begin to speak to it, prophesy to it. I will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. I will do this. I will do that. My children will live. My body will live. My finances will live. Speak it. God told Jerusalem. Jerusalem, when he was building the walls back, he said, go up to the mountain and say, this is in Zechariah 4 and 7. He said, go up to the mountain and say to the mountain, oh, great mountain before Zerubbabel, you shall be made as the plains. 
In other words, they're going to be flattened out. Then he began to shout, grace, grace, because the grace of God will cause it to come into being. Yes, amen. The way you get out of that valley, I say it again, of dry bones and dead dreams and failed visions is you prophesy your way back out of it. Amen. But it won't happen until you've gone through a crucifixion. That's right. Until there's been death and burial in your own life to your own flesh and, and you thought you had it made because God was going to use you so mighty and everything dies out and all of a sudden when you get to the place that God knows that you're going up to a higher level a higher anointing he'll begin to place that back in you and you begin to prophesy to that dead dream and say God I know that this is what you wanted me to do and God I am determined by your help God it's going to happen Come on, give him a hand clap. And when you do that, it will revive. So quit being so negative. Quit complaining. Quit talking about all of our problems. We don't deny they're there, but God. But God. But God. Let me try to finish this up. Speak Lie, children of God, into your marriage. Speak life into your body. Speak it into your business. You speak it into that vision. You speak it into that promise. And God will move at the proper sign because now you're doing it in faith. You're not doing it because you so thought you were so great that God was going to give you this and that. No, now you know that it's going to happen, but he's the one that's going to do it. Amen. He's moving in ways. He's moving in situations you never dreamed he would move in. You never ever thought it would happen that way, but he's doing it, Paula, because now it's in God's hands and it's out of yours. And then the third valley is called the Valley of Baca in Psalms 84. And i preached about this many times because I've been in it enough times. The Valley of Baca. You see, Psalms 84, when, not if, when, it's going to happen, church, when you pass through the Valley of Baca, it shall become a spring of water unto you. What does Baca mean? You know what it means? Weeping. When you pass through your valley of weeping, how many of us have been weeping lately? How many of us has done that till the tears have rolled down our eyes? And we, he said, they shall pass through. Honey, when you're going through your weeping process, don't build a cabin and stay there. Amen. Don't do that. If you do, it will destroy you. There are people who enjoy gloom and doom. You ever been around anybody like that? To where you just feel like, let me just get away from them. That's all I hear is, is there's too much mourning in Zion. Too much depression. And that's what the devil's looking for. He says a roaring lion. He's out seeking whom he may devour. And he goes after the weakest in the herd. And as long as you're weeping and crying and depressed, and feel like you're going to die, you are his victim. Amen. Church, how do I get out? The Bible said put on the garment of praise for the spirit of happiness. Y'all didn't know I could sing. <laughs>
me and that's bad. Brother, you, Brother Luke, you talk twice as much as he listened. <laughs> he was a talker. It wasn't that I didn't, didn't talk that much. I just couldn't get a word in edgeware. <laughs> but I've learned. I got two ears and one mouth. So I need to listen twice as much as I talk. And you do a whole lot better. Do you hear? If you need, go up the valley weeping and you feel like you're dry. Oh, come on. How many of y'all ever been spiritually dry? Amen. Oh, my goodness. I could write you a book on that. I could. Sometimes it seems like, Sister Diane, the waters of heaven have dried up. You know, the spiritual waters I'm talking about. And when that happens to me, I mean, I had prayed and cried. And Sean, honestly, to goodness, I would go for days and it felt like I was praying the walls were just bouncing it back and bouncing it back. And finally, I'd get so fed up and I'd say, God, I gotta hear from you. I, I don't want just mere words going up. You know what he said to me? Numerous times. He he'd take me back to the book of Numbers. And in the book of Numbers, Israel was needing water. They had no water to drink. You know what God told them? He said, I want you to get over there and get you some shovels. And this is what really the leader there told them. He said, I want you to get you some shovels. Get ready to dig. But God gave them the answer. He said, now I want you to line the people up. And while y'all digging, I want you to have the, the singers. And I want them to sing a song. Spring up, oh well, spring up. And I had to cry out to God. And I said, spring up, oh well, spring up. God, I need to feel you. I need the heavenly waters to flow. And I say, Spring up, oh well, spring. And then I'd start singing every song I could think and couldn't sing a lick to. And I'd just sing them. And it wouldn't be long, Brother Ward, till all of the walls would back away. And the Spirit of God and the heavenly waters. Okay? But honey, you need to learn to praise him when all of hell is breaking loose against you. Listen, church, everywhere I go, I hear of what the enemy is doing to the churches. I hear of the death everywhere. Not just here, everywhere you go. It is taking place. But I have determined, I have determined that no matter what happens, we are still victorious. Amen. Amen. Yes. I have seen people raise up in this church since some have gone on to glory. Others are raising up. They're beginning to move into positions. They're doing things that God had desired for them to do that perhaps they would never have done if things had not happened the way that they happened. God has a plan. God has a reason for all of us. And we are victorious. We are victorious. And I'm going to tell you right now, I don't want a doom and gloom ending to this message. I don't want it. I don't want it. Amen. I am so tired of hearing words of defeat everywhere you go. I get phone calls on top of phone calls. Sister Luke, pray for our church. Sister Luke, pray for this, pray for that. It's not the phone calls that I mind, but it's all of the troubles and the problems and the doom and the gloom, and they don't know which way to turn. And I cannot tell you how many times a question has been asked to me. Sister Luke, can you tell us what's going on? What? I can't. I'm not God. Amen. I don't have the answers. That's right. But I know who 